one of the main things they were dealing with is trying to figure out if a certain company was actually using log4j and if, if indeed so, what version. Finding that out was the biggest problem. If those companies had a desk phone, all they had to do was run a search on a JSON or an XML file. That's it. You know exactly where it is. You know exactly what version. Uh, it makes things a lot simpler. Welcome to the DevSec for Startups podcast, the show that makes security a first-class citizen for small businesses. My name is Jeremy Hess, Head of Developer Relations at Aquilas, the secrets management SaaS platform. This interview podcast brings security experts and practitioners together to offer practical and actionable ways for startups to implement security best practices using shift left principles without interrupting developer life cycles. I'd like to welcome fellow developer advocate, Barack Brudo. He works for a really cool startup called Scribe Security. And I'm really happy that Barack is joining us today because as you know, we usually talk with CTOs, CISOs, things like that. But this time we get to speak to someone who has a little bit more experience from a developer level. And so we get to hear a little bit more detail and a little bit more about what it means to deal with security from the developer side. So Barak, really happy to have you. And before we get into you talking a little bit about yourself and about the company, can you give us just a little bit of information of, uh, you know, we're here to talk about integrity, right? And, and software supply chain security. So can you give us a little bit of a breakdown, you know, in your mind, just something quick about, you know, what does that mean to secure a software supply chain and, and what type of integrity are we referring to? Sure. Um, well, the main problem with software supply chain, as a lot of people know, is that when you're using a library, a tool, a piece of code that somebody else wrote, you're basically getting a black box in most cases. You're getting the code, you have no idea what's in it, and there's a good chance that that code or tool that you're using is also using other libraries, to tools, and code that other people have developed, and so on and so forth. Uh, case, a famous case like SolarWinds showed us that it's enough to make a tiny, tiny change in the code somewhere down the line, and then uh, unsuspecting people by the thousands can eventually get impacted. So the integrity that we're talking about here is just that, to make sure that code, be it your original code or open source packages, has not been tampered with, has not been changed from its original pristine condition. That's essentially it. Fantastic. I like that. Concise, clear. And uh, so let's talk a little bit about your background because uh, uh, you've only started working for Scribe Security for just a few months now, as far as I understand. So mm -hmm. can you give us a little bit about where you came from, what brought you to Scribe and and a little bit about what Scribe is trying to do in terms of uh, you know, integrity for security uh, of uh, software supply chains? Sure. Um, I have a very eclectic background. I didn't always know what I wanted to do. Um, after the Army, I started as a programmer. I worked for a few years, but it was very boring. So I, I made a complete direction change. I went and I studied education and art. I'm actually an art teacher <laughs> by degree. Wow. Uh, yeah. But after I got my degree, I discovered, too, you know, the surprise of no one, that being a teacher in Israel is not that easy and definitely not that rewarding. So I worked in a lot of other related fields to art. I was a photographer assistant. I designed websites. I worked as a graphic designer in, in, a, in the ad company. Uh, and then obviously, because you know I, I like to be able to eat and afford rent, I went back to <laughs> development. And I worked for quite a number of years as a developer in various fields. I actually came to Scribe for an interview as a front-end uh, developer. Um, and they saw that I was you know, relatively articulate and, and presentable, I guess. So they offered me this uh, job in a new field, which I'd never heard of until they offered it. And uh, here I am, yeah. That's so. great, fantastic. Yeah, so um, yeah, well, we know each other as part of uh, the, the developer advocate crew uh, in, mm -hmm. in the Israel uh, region. So that's great. Um, so let's talk a little bit about S bombs. Uh, what is it that uh, an S bomb is? Explain that a little bit to us about what that means and sort of how it was done previously and 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 how it's changing. Sure. 
And SBOM, S-B-O-M, Software Bill of Materials, is just like any other bill of materials that you can think of. Um, the easiest uh, parallel that I can, that I usually use to draw to is if you go to the supermarket and you look at a packet of some sort of food, you have no idea what's in there because the packet is closed, but if you turn it around and you, you can see all the ingredients, sometimes even down to the chemical composition, so you know exactly what's in it. You know if there's anything in it that you're allergic to, you know if there's anything in it that you might object to on a conscious level or some other reason you might you know, object to the country was manufactured or some other sort of problem. So a software bill of materials is basically the same thing, except it does the same breakdown to a software uh, product or artifact. It breaks down that product down to the file level, and it gives you a bunch of other information other than just these are all the files that are in the product. It gives you uh, added value like the relations between those files. What is a dependency? What was created as a part of a test or, or, or as a different uh, runtime process from a different file or library, it breaks down uh, unique identifiers, the system on which that uh, software was developed, uh, and it includes unique identifiers to files or libraries like file hashes. Now, all that information can be used for a lot of different things. The easiest one is, again, like I said in the beginning, to check if you're allergic or if you have a problem to any of the ingredients in that code. Um, SBOMs were actually started to develop in 2014, that's a while now, but uh, they were quite obscure. They were you know, in use in some parts of the industry, but they were not broadly known. Um, a couple of years ago, I think in 2018 or 2019, CISA, which is the Cybersecurity and uh, Infra Infrastructure Security Agency in the US, started to really push the SBOM idea as a way to create a standard that everybody in the software industry can get behind to create something to increase the transparency of not only the software supply chain, but of you know stuff like open source that everybody is using on a regular basis to stop the, um, well, basically the hiding of what it is you're actually using or how, so that if there's a problem, like recently Log4j, nobody would just be hiding of this is the product and, you know, I don't know if, I don't even know if it's in it. Uh, with an SBOM, you can just check. Uh, there are still various problems with this, uh, especially if you're trying to break down a product and you just don't know how a certain piece is, is you know, what's, what constitutes a certain piece. And some people are still selling products with a license agreement that prohibits you from checking under the hood. Uh, so that's something that needs to be dealt with. And again, there are other problems, like if you're thinking of software these days, a lot of it might be on the cloud and completely distributed. There's not even a single uh, product. It's just a bunch of lambdas and, and processes that are running serverless everywhere. So calling all of that collection of product and breaking it down to the file level, slightly more complicated. But in a sense, trying to keep it simple, having an SBOM is good for you, the developer, because uh, it helps you discover problems as soon as they come up. You don't have to spend hours digging through legacy code to see if you actually have the problem. And it's doubly good for the consumer because you know exactly what you're getting. And if there's a problem, again, you can easily find it. I spoke uh, a couple of uh, weeks ago to uh, a researcher, uh, a security researcher in the cyber field about the uh, Log4j problem. And they, they were describing it, describing the solution, how they were able to find if a certain company was actually uh, impacted by the problem. And he told me, not to me personally, but to the crowd uh, listening, that one of the main things they were dealing with is trying to figure out if a certain company was actually using Log4j, and if, if indeed so, what version. Finding that out was the biggest problem. If those companies had an SBOM, all they had to do was run a search on a JSON or an XML file. That's it. You know exactly where it is. You know exactly what version. Uh, it makes things a lot simpler. Well, I feel like those things do change quickly, especially in, you know, DevOps um, and things like that, where, you know, you're constantly updating packages, things are always changing. So how does an SBOM keep up with those changes, those consistent changes? Exactly like that. An SBOM is not a static thing. It's not something that happens and then you forget about it. An SBOM, a proper one, is uh, attached to your build process, just like any other 
test in a CI CD automation. And every time there's an update, every time you update your dependencies, you change a file, you change anything, the SBOM is recreated with the exact build. And obviously, if you're conscientious about security and about documentation, you'll keep all those other SBOMs. So you have an exact, uh, let's call it uh, evidence trail of exactly what changed, exactly what happened. So if, heavens forbid, something breaks, you can trace it down. You can do a simple file comparison and see exactly what changed between your previous product and your current one, see where the problem is. Now, uh, I did mention, you, you mentioned that this is getting more and more attention, and that's true, uh, essentially because last year in May 2021, uh, the Biden administration released an executive order, uh, number 14028. Now, its topic, its major topic is uh, improving the nation's cybersecurity. There's an entire section, there's section four, that deals with uh, the, the security of the software supply chain and cybersecurity in general, and it mentions SBOM by name. It's uh, told uh, NIST to build regulations that have to deal that are based on this executive order. They already did that. It's going to become basically a part of all new uh, contracts in the U.S. in May this year. Really close. Uh, and again, SBOM is mentioned by name. So obviously, a lot of companies, especially if they're working with the U.S. government, are starting to take notice. This is getting more and more attention. There's more and more webinars and, and talks about this. And like I said, CISA is definitely pushing this for the betterment of everybody, I believe. That's, even if you don't remember anything else from this short podcast, if you remember an SBOM and you want to incorporate it into your product, that's just great. That's I did my job. Well, what would you say, well, then what would you say would be sort of the, the level of, you know, let's say percentage in your mind of, Let's take smaller companies as an example, right? We're a, more of a startup type of podcast. So like in terms of startups that you've seen uh, in your time so far, do you think that SBOMs are relatively common or are they still pretty rare? Unfortunately, they're still pretty rare. Um, I, I've done a lot of reading and listening, obviously, but I'm, I'm looking for stuff about SBOMs because that's part of my job. Uh, last week, we were both at the uh, CyberTech uh, conference Lots of security companies, lots of interested parties who are there to shop for security uh, products of various kinds. And one of my first questions to anybody who came to our booth was, do you know what an SBOM is? After three days of conference, I found three people who initially knew what an SBOM is. I had to explain wow. it to everyone else. I'm sure it's going to get to become a lot more common, especially with the changing regulation. But for now, it is unfortunately still a relatively unknown uh, piece of, of you know, security uh, idea, which is a shame because it's so, so easy to use. Even if you don't do anything with that SBOM, even if you don't externalize it, you don't send it to your clients, you don't send it to anybody. Just having a, a simple piece of code in your pipeline to create that SBOM for you, for your own documentation, so you know exactly what's in your product. Even if you're just doing that, you're already you know, head and shoulders above a lot of other people. Well, that's a, there's a question there then. I mean, this is exactly what we're trying to do. You know, with this podcast, we're trying to help companies, especially startups, young companies who look at security as a bit of a burden, trying to help them figure out ways to take basic steps in, in security and securing their code to, you know, without having to developers you know, have too much friction with their work, right? Don't, don't yep. take their life cycle, you know, their, their developer cycles, uh, you know, away from them, right? They're focused on making a product, right? Now, security is super important. Everyone knows that, but it's usually thought of last. So what would you say would be a quick way to have an SBOM, uh, you know, created and managed simply for developers? I mean, is this also, and is it more, uh, front end back end developers that need to deal with this, or is this something that's more DevOps type of uh, you know action? It's more of a DevOps thing, definitely. For a single developer, there wouldn't be that much benefit unless he wants to also start looking at the individual packages and, and libraries that he's or she is incorporating into their code. But when you're looking at the entire product, or you know, usually it would have if we're talking about a big one multiple pipelines, multiple images, some of them might be uh, then internalized and used in a different pipeline. For that sort of a scenario or any sort of a scenario where you actually do have a CI/CD pipeline, 
incorporating uh, an SBOM build at the very end, right when you're actually building that image before you're uh, sending it off to where, whatever registry you're sending it to, that's like the perfect time. It, like I said, even if you don't want to do anything with that SBOM, just generating it and keeping it so you, you have it, you know exactly what you're using, you're already better than, than a lot of other places. And as the uh, industry improves and technology improves, there's going to be uh, machine readable SBOMs that you can automatically send between customer, uh, between vendor and, and supplier. You can immediately check when you're receiving a product, uh, the SBOM attached to it, uh, if it includes anything that is problematic to you. And again, th that's not even covering the Scribe's product. This is just generally including an SBOM with your product. And because, like I said, there are even open source code uh, products that are used to create those SBOMs. You don't even have to use anything or, or that it costs money or incorporate any sort of complex uh, customization. Just go to any of the three major SBOM uh, standards, which are Cyclone DX, SPDX, or SWID. They have thriving forums uh, and communities that are currently working to improve them. They also have a bunch of tools which are published on those uh, places. Some of them open source, some of them are not. Ours is, you know, currently not open source, but it is free. So, you know, you get the best of both worlds. Um, so, yeah, even if you're not doing anything with that SBOM except, you know, having it for your own peace of mind, that's great. Doing more with it, if you're looking at the Scribe solution, we're using that SBOM as a way to uh, guarantee integrity. We, 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 there are two places that we're checking integrity. One, we're creating an SBOM in the SCM, your repo, and then we're creating an SBOM um, in the build. We're basically putting it on both ends of the CI/CD pipeline. Any, any person who has worked in code knows that there's almost no reason for most files to change between your SCM and your build. If something changed, something might be problematic with your CI/CD, might be an indication of a temper of some sort from somewhere. So that's one thing. And the other really, really big thing is that currently we're aggregating open source information and package management information currently from NPM, but eventually we'll go over all of them so that we can guarantee that whatever library open source package you're using, they came from the correct place. Uh, what I mean by that is that sometimes there are mirrors or men in the middle attacks. And again, we're looking for temper. We're looking for a different code than the original. If we find something like that, it usually means something bad. And one of the problems you didn't mention for a lot of smaller companies and developers is um, fatigue from way, way, way too many alerts. If you've yeah. ever worked with uh, NPM with Node, um, a lot of times when you, like, let's say you clone a repo from GitHub and you're trying to do NPMI and then NPM start, you get a huge list, huge list of CVEs. Most people, me included, if I, if I know it's something that I'm going to use anyway, I'm just ignoring it. Yeah, I'll try to patch, you know, the basic things if I can, but going into the code, looking for what might break if I change something, too much of a problem. I'm, I'm trying to trust the people who designed this to do that for me. So getting all those notifications and warnings, way too much. Most people just don't look even, don't even look at it anymore. So what we're trying to do is create something simple. We do the comparison, we check for the integrity, we give you a report with a simple headline that says, out of that many files in your repo, that many files are fine, haven't changed that, you know, basically like one, two files or no files were changed in the, in the interim. Out of that many files or packages in the open source that you're using, that many files and packages are okay and that many files are not. You can easily see that there's a big numbers at the top of the report. So you don't have to go digging into that SBOM to see if there's any specific problems. You could keep it though, you should keep it. You should even sign it cryptographically so that it's, you know, immutable. And then if there's ever a problem that comes up like colors or log4j, which wasn't a problem until it was, just go over that SBOM and you have it figured out in a minute. That's great. Yeah, and, and so this obviously is an attack vector that's not that hasn't been previously thought of too much, right? It's been something that people have sort of left to the wayside. I mean, what well, do you there's one of the reasons that Scribe decided to go after this route is because of the whole executive order thing that, that made it, what, executive order was, was uh, released, I think, in part uh, following the solar winds incident, which was huge for this, uh, uh, the US government. There were nine different 
major branches, including the Pentagon and the uh, DOD, which were attacked or compromised, not really through attacked. Solar Winds, uh, Solar through Winds, obviously, Solar Winds, they, yeah. they use Solar Winds software. Yep. And that means there was a back door into their system, and the attacker, supposedly Russians, but who can tell definitively, got into their emails, into various other information. I'm not going to go into Solar Winds because it was covered to death in a lot of other yes, places. Yes, absolutely. We did but, one as well. <laughs> yeah. So uh, essentially, having any sort of change in the code is considered a bad thing. But there's a lot of other companies that are checking for a lot of other very important things, like uh, secrets or um, CVEs or code problems of a different sort, like uh, problems in uh, loops or problems in different um, names for variables. There's a lot of other products out there. And the fact that you're checking for integrity doesn't mean that you're forgetting everything else. You should still have uh, the, you know, your, your build uh, system or your build environment separate from everything else. If possible, ephemeral, you know, if you're really, really tight on security, you should have 2FA or 3FA for everybody who's going into the system. You should also check your code for secrets and for other CVEs and problems. But the problem of a code changing is such that it's so easy to miss. Even, you know, even if you're looking at solar winds, the code was fine when it got to the build server. Like two or three lines were added. Even people who knew the code looked at it later and, and couldn't definitively say that they didn't put them there themselves. So having a way to definitively and easily compare files, any files of whatever language, whatever yeah. system, to make sure that they weren't tampered with, I think that's, that's a good thing. Absolutely. Yeah, integrity is pretty much everything when it comes to your code. I mean, it just seems it's like... Uh, it's just well, one of the big things. <laughs> definitely one of the most important things. I mean, if you're not, you know, ensuring that your code is the same here and there, you know, in both places, then you're definitely, you know, you could potentially be up Creek. Right. So yeah. um, what I like to do for, for the last question that I ask uh, in these interviews, and you kind of covered it a little bit in your previous answer was if you could give one or two tips on, you know, in general for developer security, it doesn't necessarily have to be related to, you know, what you you do or what the company does, right? But, but in general, if, if you had a, one or two tips for developers, uh, if they're focusing on security and they work for startups, so you know what are what are in your eyes, you know the first one or two things that developers should at least be aware of and try to implement, you know, and it wouldn't make it difficult, you know, wouldn't be a burden on their work. Well, um, one of the tips that I found really uh, useful, but that depends if you have somebody who can actually do the job, is to check uh, all the files, tools, libraries that the company is going to use and create a list, a separate list of the approved files, versions, libraries, open source packages, everything like that. So you don't leave it down to the developers to pick whatever it is that strikes their fancy at the time. Um, I was a developer, so I know that sometimes I would get a task or a problem, and I would just start looking at NPM, in my case, because I was working with JavaScript. I was just looking at NPM and, and looking at packages. Yes, I did do my supposed due diligence. I checked that there were stars and there was not too many problems, and there were enough downloads of the package, and it looked okay. But then I would just download it and start messing with it. If it didn't work, fine, I'll remove it, work something else. But there are instances that just downloading that package, just by doing that, you're already infected with something. There's already some sort of code that uh, that ran on your machine, on your, um, you know, Node.js or your Node, anything like that. You're already infected, you're already compromised. Anything you do from that on, it's not a problem. So if, if there's actually somebody in the organization, a CISO or a DevOps, somebody who knows what they're doing and can create that curated list, you can save a lot of problems later on. Another good tip is to, um, set version numbers, as in don't just use a certain library and let NPM, and again, I'm using that as, a, as an example because I was a JavaScript developer. Don't let NPM automatically update it because the recent case of colors uh, was that the actual developer decided that he didn't want to contribute to open source anymore. He created a, an endless loop, an infinite loop in the library, created a new version. It was automatically pushed to everybody who was using it, who didn't set their version and it broke wow. a lot of things 
and it was completely we wouldn't scribe wouldn't have caught it because it was a legitimate upload from a legitimate source that was the developer of the product we can't catch malicious developers that's still we still don't know how to do that but uh if you know that you're going to be using a certain library set the the uh, version number and only change it if you are absolutely certain that this is something that you want to do um those are the two like main tips other than obviously using an sbom and asking you know other people that you're working with to do to, to do the same so that the more transparency happens across the entire supply chain the better all of us will be absolutely wonderful thanks so much for those tips and barack it was really great to have you for this episode um, and before we sign off, do you have any, I think you said that, you, or we talked earlier and, uh, you have, uh, an event coming up pretty soon. Do you want to quickly let everybody know how they could, uh, access it? Sure. Uh, all they have to do is go to the scribesecurity.com website and go to resources. There's webinars. Currently there's only one because this is our first one and my first one too. Uh, it's going to be, uh, taking place on the, uh, 31st of this month. So about three weeks from now. 7 p.m. Israel time, uh, 12 p.m. EDT, if I remember correctly. And we're going to be covering the new regulations that I mentioned. We're going to be covering uh, an idea that is called continuous uh, assurance connected to CI and CD, but something slightly different. And we're going to show our new product and, and you know demonstrate how it works, which hopefully will show that it's not that scary as some people might fear. And it could be really fun to, to play with it. Fantastic. All right. Well, we'll be sure to make it to that event and really looking forward to it. Thank you so much for being one of our first guests on the DevSec for Startups podcast. Really happy to have you. And we look forward to uh, having you on uh, later when we hear more updates about how, you know, Scribe Security is, is moving in the world. So thank you very much for your time and have a really great day. You too.